Hi, it's Friday, May the 3rd, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Luke's Gospel. Today we're in Luke chapter 18, verses 15 to 17, just a tiny little bit. Um, we're in the midst of um, some teachings of Jesus. Luke has put together some teachings, um, parables, sayings, sometimes with commentary, um, which I try to resist when Luke tells us what a parable is about, um, because I think a parable is about many things. Uh, and when Luke tells us what the saying is about, then, well, just let the saying stand for itself, because uh, I think we hear things differently. Anyway, regardless, uh, yesterday we had what was called a parable about a Pharisee who was comparing himself to a tax collector and feeling pretty good about himself. Luke told us um, what it meant, and then there was some commentary by Jesus to indicate that. But the parable on its own caused a fair bit of wondering, uh, at least for me. Not as much as the one before, uh, but nevertheless, an invitation to, to wonder. And now we move forward um, with uh, a story and uh, a saying, but all done in, in three verses. So here it is, Luke 18, 15 to 17. People were bringing even infants to Jesus that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they sternly ordered them not to do it. But Jesus called for them and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. There you go. So, Jesus likes kids. Yeah, I think we all like kids, right? Um, well, apparently not. Apparently the uh, the disciples didn't. <laughs> didn't like kids. Um, so why? Why were the disciples um, telling them not, telling people not to bring their children to them? So I, I look at that and go, it's the disciples, not the inner 12, right? Not even the 70. This is the disciples, so they are students of Jesus. Um, are they bothered um, that this is teaching time, that, that, that they could be being taught right now, but oh, Jesus is wasting his time with the little kids. Um, we're here to learn. We want, we want, we want the lessons. Um, is that what's bothering them? Um, do they doubt the motives of the parents bringing them, um, say, you know, you've just brought them to get some kind of cheap blessing so your child will be healthy and okay, and uh, and our Jesus is not like that. Jesus is not a, a lucky charm. Is that what it is? Uh, is it that children are not yet um, full human beings? So let's wait till they are. Let's wait till they're grown up, right? Till they've till they've uh, till they've survived. Um, and then, you know, I, I, for boys, I imagine that we wouldn't call them children after their bar mitzvah. So 12, 13 years old, now they're bad. Now they can come and be with Jesus. But before that, they're not really ready. They got to learn the fundamentals. They've got to grow up. Maybe that's what bothers the disciples. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I do know that I sometimes bristle at, and a lot of my colleagues are very upset at people who want to have sentimental baptisms. You know, please, Reverend, uh, when my grandchildren are in town uh, in a couple of months, could you please baptize them? Because ugh, my daughters won't get them baptized, and I just, I really want them baptized. And why? Why do you really want them baptized? Well, you know, I, I need them to, um, um, well, I... I I need them to go to heaven. That's not what baptism's about, you know. And and I, and I want to explain that to them. And by the way, this is about a relationship, and you're going to do this without the parents involved. You're going to scoot around your daughter to do this. You have a magical understanding of baptism, and that's not the baptism that we that we practice that we believe in in this community. So. Doing it for you doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, it's not sincere. It's not real. And, and no, I, I don't think we should do this. Now, I don't send them away. I say I really need to talk to the parents. <laughs> uh, and sometimes that leads to a conversation that does lead to a baptism. And sometimes it doesn't. It puts it aside. But I recognize the disciples say, no, don't do that. I don't know why they're bringing the baby, the children, to bless them so that they will 
never be harmed. So they'll go to heaven, whatever it is, to inoculate them against the world. Maybe. What the disciples have come to learn, of course, is that being in a relationship with God through Jesus, being in a relationship with Jesus, does not inoculate you against the world. In fact, it, it inspires you to dig in deeper into the world uh, and to love the world, which is difficult and painful. So, maybe that's what bothered them. Um, maybe it was just, yeah, they're, they're, they're teaching. They want, to, they want to learn, and they don't want these children to take up learning time. They're not learning well. And, and I go, well, is that reasonable? I don't know if it's reasonable, but I have certainly heard a number of parents in my time complain about streaming students in school. We're in a classroom, we mix people with different learning aptitudes and abilities, abilities and disabilities. We put them all together in the same class and we'll say, well, why, why does Johnny have to be held back? Because, because Stephen back there doesn't get it. Now the teacher has to spend all that extra time with Stephen and Johnny's not getting the education he deserves. Okay. I have some different feelings and attitudes about that. My son is a teacher. He has different feelings and attitudes about, about that and how he best spends his time and, and, and who benefits and how they benefit. It's not as simple an issue as I want to think it is. Is that what's going on for the disciples? Like Jesus has only got so much teaching time and we're going to take this and we might become one of the 70. We might, we're going to go spread the word here. These kids are going to go and go home and, and, and have a nap. They're not going to change the world. Maybe that's what's bothering them. Could be. Or maybe they just don't like kids. <coughs> All these things are possible. Um, and, and it's a strange invitation to me sometimes to wonder about my motivations for things. Um, I mean, this is just good life advice. This isn't, isn't particularly scriptural. And maybe it's what's been going on in my life lately. I don't know. But it's a good invitation for me just to stop and go, well, wait a minute. Why am I doing this? Why am I so for this project or why am I so against that? Why does this person make me crazy such such that I, I don't even want to listen to them? What is it really? What's really going on? Um, is it that they are children? Uh, that they are not, um, in my mind, uh, qualified to have this discussion with me? They haven't put in the time, they haven't the expertise, they haven't been the, through the things I've been through. I have no time for them. Oh my gosh, is that really my attitude? Is that really my motivation? Because I need to then think a little bit. Where am I on the humility scale? <laughs> is it realistic? Um, boy, am I really that full of myself that I think there are people from whom I am greatly distanced, that I don't have to talk to them, that they've got nothing to teach me, that I have nothing to offer them that might actually be of value, they might appreciate, understand, and, and, and grow with? Because if that's what's going on with me, I need to sit down. Oh, I need to sit down for a while. I need to, I need to pray. I need to talk uh, to God. I need to listen to God. This story reminds me of that. And maybe that is what's going on with the children. Let the little children come to me, Jesus is saying. Everybody, everybody should come to me. And, and not so that I can bless them and inoculate them from the world, but so that they can become part of this community and we can all learn from each other. We can learn from children. We absolutely can. And we can learn from people who have different perspectives than, than have we. And we can learn from people who have visible disabilities. And we can learn from people who have emotional struggles. We can learn from all sorts of people. And if we can be described with any of those things, we also have something to offer. We don't need to pull ourselves out of community. You know, well, I just, no, it's, they don't want to hear from me because they know what I'm going to say. I'm just going to talk about, all I'm going to do is talk about accessibility. All I'm going to do is talk about how we need to make this more accessible for people with physical disabilities. And they don't want to hear that because they're tired of hearing from me. So I know. No, Jesus said, no, I, I need to hear from everybody. Let all of them come to me. Even the ones that you might disparage, the ones that you might devalue. Let all of them come to me. Let the children come to me. Do not stop them. <coughs> Excuse me. He, he then goes on 
to, to say more, right? He says, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. And boom, there's a nugget, right? Such as these the kingdom of God belongs. Tell, truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. What does that mean? How do I enter the kingdom of God as a little child? And, and, and why is it that not, not doing that prevents me from getting it? I get it. If you'd like to, we could sit down for the next 30 minutes and I can talk knowledgeably about the Trinity. I can make it interesting. I can make it witty. I can make it boring. I, but I can sure as heck talk about it. I got my stuff. I can quote scripture if you'd like. I can put Job into, into a different framework that you'll read it differently than you've ever read it before. I, I can talk to you about Lot as a comic opera. I can compare the Gospels and, and, and give you a pretty good idea of which one was written when and why this is commenting on that and what events were going on that affected this and why we shouldn't take that um, you know, as, as, uh, as, as, as law, but we should take that as commentary. I can do all of that stuff. But that does not guarantee my participation in the kingdom of God. It guarantees my participation in some books. So what is it that a little child does that I don't do? I'm wondering here. I don't know. Children play. Children are not perfect. Let's not imagine for a second that they're all lovely, sweetness, and light. They are not. They are crabby. They are angry. Uh, they can have tantrums. They have all sorts of things about children that aren't wonderful. But children do play, and they tend to play easily. They will suspend belief. And some say, well, because that part of their brain hasn't developed, you know, they don't have that sense of permanence. So when you play peekaboo, they really think you've disappeared. You know, they don't know you're there anymore until you reappear. Then, my God, they're so surprised to see you. That's, that's their brain development. Okay, I hear that. I got a neuroscientist son. He'll tell you that's uh, how much of that's true. Sure. I think there's a point, though, when that is no longer true. And I think the children then willfully continue to play the game because they now know it's a game. And it makes grandpa laugh. Then it's fun to be laughing together. I think the children will, in the effort to play, to be free, they will suspend disbelief. They will let it go for the moment. Even when they now get it. They may not get it for a while, but then they do. I think so. I have been told that, you know, children under the age of, what was the age? I'm trying to remember now. Under the age of 12, can't, no, I think it's seven. Under the age of seven, can't think metaphorically. Under the age of 12, don't think metaphorically. So, you know, um, so an eight-year-old does walk around looking and expecting to see Spider-Man swinging through um, the skyline because they don't get that that's not really true. Maybe. I've met some pretty sharp eight-year-olds. Not sure that that's necessarily the case. Um, but I appreciate that we have different levels of development. But I think there's, for, for any of us, there's a point at which we come to understand something and yet we will still play the game. Because it's fun to play. It's fun to engage. And I wonder if the kingdom of God isn't playful. Hmm. I'm trying to think of the name of a theologian. For some reason, his mind, his name has gone completely from my mind. Oh, doesn't matter. He died about four or five years ago from Minnesota. Marcus Borg. There we go. Marcus Borg would talk about um, post-critical naivete. So you go in experiencing a faith, and you know nothing, and you just you just believe because you just trust the person telling you. You know, you just, you just, yeah, okay, must be true because my grandpa told me. Uh, and so you believe it. Uh, and then you start to learn. And then you start to examine some of these things. And you, you gather evidence and you gather expertise. And you look at some of the things that grandpa told you. And now you understand what grandpa was talking about. But 
we also understand the limitations of what Grandpa was talking about. That Grandpa hasn't really captured entirely correctly. It might actually be wrong in his analysis. Um, and then you learn it all. And you go, okay, I've done all the learning I'm going to do. And now I'm just going to revel in the mystery of it all. No, no, but you've, you've spent the last 30 years clearing the fog, solving the mystery. Yep, and now that I have, I want to go back into the mystery. Post-critical naivete. I want to play again. I wonder if that's the way the kingdom of God works. I loved playing when I was a kid. Playing with one kid, five kids, playing by myself, but just playing, just in what seemed to others to be an imaginary world, but it wasn't imaginary to me. Um, I mean, I knew it wasn't the same world as where I sat at a dining room table and had dinner with my parents and talked to my sister. And I, I know it wasn't the same world, but it was a very real world for me. And it was an important world for me. The kingdom of God is not exactly the same world, perhaps, um, where uh, I uh, get in my car and drive to work, where I pay my taxes and do my things and uh, get frustrated with my neighbor sometimes and respond well to difficulties sometimes and other times not so much. <laughs> uh, there is that world and I, and I function in there, but then there is this other world, this kingdom of God, where where I believe that we are all siblings capable of loving each other. Where I see God at work in the world. Where I hear and feel God calling me into the next moment. A world where I have hope because I do see God at work in the world. And I grow up and I come to understand that those worlds are separate worlds. One is kind of a dream world, I guess. Um, and the other, with a lot of work and a lot of sweat equity, I just might be able to help make a little bit better for somebody. And then I go, you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to lie in bed and calculate the odds of succeeding in creating a, a compassionate community, a, a, a loving world. I, I don't want to count the odds. No, I, I just want to believe in it because God's invited me to do that. And it's when I do that, when I stop counting the numbers, calculating the odds, then it's a whole lot easier for me to see God in the world and for me to take a stand against against violence to to step up on behalf of those who struggle and suffer it's a whole lot easier for me to go to sleep at night knowing the world is better and you see that post-critical naivete that playfulness i come to understand that those two worlds that i have now come to understand are separate actually aren't separate after all it's me that was treating them as separate so i could do my equations better but when I recognize that they're not separate, then, then I am participating in the kingdom of God. Children do that very easily. Adults less so. I was uh, on a uh, support group, I guess, a reflection group with somebody doing a, a PhD uh, in, the, in the theology of play. And it was amazing to hear her talk about her experience uh, you know, as, as she developed her thesis and she did practical work. The number of people within the church who were resistant to the idea of play. Play's not serious. Play's not real. They, were, they, just, they just automatically did not want to play or, or create space in which others could play, whether they were children or adults. And I was stunned at that. But aware of that, I start to see it in the world around me, maybe even in myself sometimes. Yeah, we are a little reluctant to play, to risk, to suspend disbelief, to imagine that this, this world of prayer, this world that is in our hearts, this world that we 
that we engage on Sunday mornings or whatever our spiritual practice is, that that world actually is, is one with the real world. And until we see that, I don't know that we can actually get it. At least that's, that's what the gospel's making me think about. That's what Luke's making me think about today. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. I'm going to leave it there with you for the week, uh, well, for the weekend, and see what you make of it. Maybe it'll, uh, maybe what I'm saying will make some sense to you or inspire you. Maybe it won't make any sense at all. You'll have a completely different thought. Maybe you've picked up something in here that I'm missing completely. Whatever you do, I just hope you spend some time wondering. And uh, I hope you have a fantastic weekend. And even more than that, hope you come back Monday because there's more to share. So until I get to see you, let me offer a prayer. Loving God, thank you for this time, this time of wonder, this time to hear voices from long ago and yet hear them as if they are in the room with us right now. God, as we, as we tend to Scripture, may we hear your voice in the present. May we be drawn to it, and may we grow in faith because we have listened. We pray in Jesus' name through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, until I get to see you, God bless you. Please know that God sees you, knows you, and loves you exactly as you are, exactly where you are. But God's love doesn't stop with you. It moves through you, and you help shape the way it moves in the world. You make a difference in the world. That's what it means to be blessed. You are loved, and you love. So don't stop. God bless you. See you on Monday.